Now we're starting to move into the much warmer time of the year. Once those easterlies start coming in, that'll tell you that, yes, we're into the Biroc season. We're seeing lots of little babies, baby reptiles, baby birds. We start to see flowering on the Christmas tree, our Muja tree, which is our spirit tree. We believe that when people die, their souls and their spirits come along, sit in these branches and they wait there. They wait for a couple of weeks so that if someone is very sick and going to die behind them, they will join them in the branches of this tree. And then they'll take their journey to the land that you see between the ocean and the sky. Kurin up, Kura, long way away. Kurin up is our heaven. When the flowers come out at the end of the year, we don't pick them because they're our souls coming back to look over the country. Very sacred tree that should be preserved and not knocked over on, on any block someone wants to clear or any roadside bird someone wants to clear to make a bigger road or anything, it shouldn't even be touched. When the weather warms up, people will follow the waterways back down, back down to these uh, inlets, and it's the start of the warmer times of the year. The Nullakai is a very special place. It's now time for the mullet, the mullet of fat. And, um, you know, we tell seasons by um, plants flowering and, and that sort of stuff. And, and so especially up inland because we see the paper bark is just starting to flower. And so that means that the mullet of fat, everything has a season when, when an animal gets fat, that's the time that it's harvested, you know. The river mouth, the riverways, they would study that. That's where the, the mullets and, and um, those sort of brim and that would come in to feed off the river flats and that's where they would put the fish traps. We're on the Wilson Inlet looking at a, an ancient Noongar fish trap that's just in the, in the shallows here, uh, really close to Denmark. There's houses just up here on the rise. We're right near town. The water level's low and even with all these dark tannins in the water we can still, still see it um, and it's just, it's pretty subtle. Like all the archaeology of Noongar country, it's always subtle. They've left such a subtle trace. The branches of nearby trees were used to build up the fish traps. The stones would be a foundation. Noongar people, it's been explained to me, targeted specific species of plants. Um, some of them have, a, have effects on the fish, kind of making them sort of docile and easy to catch. It, it wasn't like a set and forget type of trap. It was quite an active hunting process. They would leave a, a sort of a gateway in there so that they could come in. And then as soon as the tide got full, there would be um, certain men to get there because they'd have all the stuff ready to actually close that, um, that entrance off. There's probably logs and a and, um, bit of bush and stuff. And of course the tide, you know, um, recedes pretty quickly. So um, the fish would all be caught in the, in the mm. trap. Look. Hiya, you're currently my cow. This is where we all come together today to sit, learn, laugh, talk and share. This is Menang Pippelman country. Here we have the magnificent Wilson Inlet. We call it Midnalakai, and that means place of seaweed. This is the land of Menang Pippelman people. For me, you are all Menang Pippelman people as well, every single one of you. And with that, we ask you to look after, respect the country as people have been doing here for many, many thousands of years. People coming from other places out, the Wirreman people from out near the Stirlings, the Gorang from out Katanning, Tambalup, 
Everybody was coming down to these inlets, these estuaries, uh, this time of the year. So we had these amazing old fish traps. Uh, we've got beautiful sources of fresh water. Um, but we've also got another valuable resource very close by here, and that's our ochre. This particular area is really rich in a beautiful wilja, okay, and midar. Okay, wilja is the name we give to our white, yellow, brown ochres and oranges. The midar is the red, okay. Uh, and that was generally just used by men, but today we could all use them together. Ochre is a weathering product of much older and harder rocks, which we find everywhere around here on the inlet and on uh, in the south coast. These granites and dolerites that have been here for almost two billion years, when they were exposed to the air and to the atmosphere, when Australia was at a more tropical location on the earth, the minerals change, they take up water, and they're oxidized, or you can say they rust. In this area, we've got lots of different colors. Um, a normal clay mineral, like a kaolinite, would be white. And if you get some other elements mixed in, like iron and iron hydroxide, you get different colors. The brighter the color, the more iron you've got in there. The ochre can be different quality, and the better the quality, the more it was traded all around Australia. This outcrop was actually produced uh, by the building of the railway line to Albany, so only about 120 years ago. But it was probably mined somewhere. Certainly it was mined in Australia by the indigenous people for a long time, probably almost 40,000 years. A lot of the oak from this region was traded out to other people as well. It's used for ceremonial, yardi, dancing singing, identity. You're doing today what people have been doing on this particular spot for many, many thousands of years. The fact that we're still doing the same thing today, I just find it absolutely magnificent. Everything out here is our classroom. Our culture was all about sharing, sharing information with others. My role is to then pass on that information to our younger ones, our young kūnga, our young children and with respect to looking after the environment as we have been doing for many, many thousands of years.